good evening all welcome to kr narayanan bicentenary lecture series organized by institute of parliamentary affairs and in association with kerala institute for local administration first of all i invite dr dimbi vidhivagaran director general institute of parliamentary affairs for the welcome address thank you ashika uh, let's start the program uh, respected professor kishore makubwani Dr. Raju Narayana Swami, Prof. A. Ramakumar, Amb. Amrita Narayanan, Dr. Joy Ullapan and other dignitaries. Good evening. On the behalf of Institute of Parliamentary Affairs and Kerala Institute of Local Administration, I welcome you all to this program. This is the fourth lecture. This is the fifth and final lecture in the K.R. Narayanan Birth Centenary Lecture Series. The first four lectures were delivered by, respectively by, Ambassador Shivshankar Menon, Professor Gobal Guru, Professor Pradam Banu Mehta, and Sri N. Rao. Today, Professor Kishore Mahubani would speak on the topic, Can India Become Stronger Than China? Yes, it can. Professor Mahubani is one of the most respected public intellectuals of our times. He is a Singaporean civil servant, a career diplomat, and an academic. In his 33 years as a Singapore diplomat, Professor Mukhubani took many challenging assignments, serving, for example, in Pulambat, Cambodia in 1973-74 during the war. He also served two stints as Singapore's ambassador to United Nations. He also held the position of the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from 1994 to 98. Professor Mukhubani had equally illustrious career in academia. He, he was appointed the founding dean of the DQNU School of Public Policy at National University of Singapore in 2004, which he, he held till 2017. Professor Mahubwani is a prolific writer too. He has published eight books, including Can Asians Think Beyond the Age of Innocence, Has the West Lost It, etc. The latest book, Has China Won? The Chinese Challenge to American Primacy was published in 2020. Simington W. Smith, in his review in the National Interest, mentioned that Cast China One is a must read for leaders, professionals, and students who want painfully real and compelling assessment of the modern US China relations. His articles have appeared in prestigious publications such as Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, Washington Quarterly, Survival. American interest, national interest, time, some, etc. Professor Mukhubwani has received global recognition for his administrative and intellectual contributions. He was conferred the Public Administration Medal by the government of Singapore in 1998. He listed several times in the list of top global thinkers by Foreign Policy Prospect magazine. In 2009, Professor Mukhubwani was elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. The citation of the United States Foreign Policy Association Medal he received in 2004 said, a gifted diplomat, a student of history and philosophy, a pro provocative writer, and an intuitive thinker. It is a great honor to welcome Professor Kishore Mahubhavani. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Dr. Raju Narayana Sami IAS is the chair of today's section. He is the Principal Secretary of the Parliamentary Affairs Department, Government of Kerala. Apart from a distinguished civil servant, Dr. Sami is a respected academic and a writer who published more than 150 research papers in national and international journals of repute. He is a recognized PhD gate in many universities. Professor Sami won Kerala Sahitya Academy Award for his travelogue. He has also won the prestigious Homi Baba Fellowship in cyber law and awarded 19, to, to 2018 Satyendra Dubey Memorial Award by IIT Kanpur for his professional integrity in upholding human values. With immense respect, I welcome Dr. Raju Narayana Sami to chair this lecture. Professor A. Ramakumar joined this program as discussant. Professor Ramakumar is Namart Chair at School of Development Studies, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. Professor Damakumar's work on agricultural economics and banking policy 
is among the most quoted scholarly works in India. He is an expert in development economics, agrarian studies, agricultural economics, physical policy in India, national identity schemes, etc. He is a member of the planning board of Kerala since 19, 2016. Welcome, sir. Kerala Institute of Local Administration is the co-organizer of this program. For co-organizer of this pro program, I am happy to welcome Dr. Joy Ilamet, Director General, Matthew Andrews, Assistant Director, and the technical team of the Kila. It is a delight to invite students, researchers, and faculty members to this program. Welcome, friends. There will be a question and answer section after the lecture. Please write your questions and comments in the chat box. Once again, warm welcome to all, to Raju, Dr. Raju Narayana Swami. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, I am extremely delighted and privileged to preside over the fifth K.R. Narayanan Memorial Lecture. It is organized in memory of one of the greatest sons of Mother India, and on a topic of contemporary relevance. I do not want to stand between the esteemed speaker and the august audience. But before I leave the podium to the speaker, I have a humble submission to make. I was supposed to join this webinar from Tiruvannandapur the capital city of the state. But I have been deputed to one of the border districts of the state to coordinate the fight against the pandemic. In a situation, where there's a need to make a frontal assault on the citadels of COVID-19, which is looming large over the society as a whole, I request I may be permitted to leave a bit early, handing over the chair to Dr. Dimbi Divagare. My only humble request is that it may not be treated as a disrespect or disregard either to the esteemed speaker or to the audience. So over to the so over to the esteemed speaker. Over to Dr. Dibbi Divagaran, please. Professor Mahabadi's speech. Let me invite uh, Ambassador Amrita Narayan for a short uh, words, a few words. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, just a slight correction, uh, uh, Dr. Divakaran. I am the younger sister, so the, not the former ambassador. I am Amrita Narayanan, uh, and I, I work at the International Criminal Court in the Netherlands. My sister, uh, my sister Chitra, who is the former ambassador, uh, hopefully will be able to join us a little later. But first of all, I would like to thank the Institute of Parliamentary Affairs and the Kerala Institute of Local Administration for organizing this wonderful uh, lecture series in memory and in honor of my father, K.R. Narayanan. I had the opportunity to listen to quite a few of the lectures and I want to say that it was, they were just fantastic and um, wonderful. And I'm so glad that the Institute has, has, has done this. Um, so I look forward and I welcome uh, Professor Mabubani, and I look forward to hearing your speech today. And thank you, everyone. Well, Dr. Raju, Dr. Dimpi, uh, Ambassador Amita, uh, Professor Ramakuma, it's such a great pleasure and honor uh, to be invited to speak in honor of Mr. K.R. Narayanan. Uh, I'm very sorry that I never had the pleasure of meeting him in person. Of course, I've heard of him. <laughs> Uh, I spent 33 years in the Singapore diplomatic service, so uh, whenever, whenever I was posted overseas, my best friends were often uh, the diplomats from India, and therefore, of course, I heard of Mr. Uh, K.R. Narayanan. And uh, uh, certainly, I'm really glad that this, uh, you're giving me this great honor of delivering the fifth and final lecture in this uh, centenary lecture series. And um, I thought to make it meaningful, uh, why not pick a provocative topic? <laughs> and the topic I chose was, uh, can India become uh, stronger than China? And so the first question to answer is, uh, what do I mean by becoming stronger? Well, quite simple. By stronger, I mean have a bigger economy than China's. And the goal is uh, this lecture is explain why I believe India can have a bigger economy and indeed can have the biggest economy in the world <laughs> and how India can set about achieving it. 
And I'll, but I'll divide my lecture into three parts, okay? In part one, I'll explain why I'm confident that India can become the, have the largest economy in the world. In part two, I'll explain what I think are two key principles to, that can enable India to become number one. And part three, I'll suggest some maybe three concrete steps that India can take immediately uh, to begin that journey towards becoming the largest economy in the world. But having sort of, in a sense, raised your expectations, let me also say, in all honesty, uh, especially to an audience in India, that some of the things I'm going to say to you will make you feel uncomfortable. But here's the choice. You can say comfortable things and then deal with uncomfortable outcomes. Or maybe you want, maybe it's better to deal with uncomfortable truths and then get comfortable outcomes. So that, uh, that's the approach I'm going to take today. The goal is to see how we can ensure that India has the largest economy in the world. And let me, in part one, explain why I'm confident that India can be, become number one. The first reason, of course, is historical evidence. As British uh, historian Angus Madison has documented from the year one to the year 1820, for 1800 of the last 2000 years, the two largest economies of the world were always those of China and India. So what happened in 1820? Well, the British arrived. As Shashi Taru, a distinguished uh, citizen or son of Kerala has documented, when the British arrived, India's share of global GNP in the world was 23%. By the time the British left in 1947, it had gone down to 3%. Today, sadly, the share of India in the global economy is still about 3%. Now, India's share of the global population is 18%. Hence, its share of the global GNP should also be 18%, if you assume that the average Indian is as intelligent and as capable as the average human being uh, in the world. And this is the second reason why I'm very confident that India can have the largest economy in the world, because the average Indian is clearly as intelligent and as capable as any other human being. And I hope that this is an uncontroversial statement, but I would like to also add a controversial statement which is that the average Indian can outperform the average citizens of other communities. And you can see why such a statement is obviously controversial. So let me back it up with some evidence. The most competitive human laboratory in the world is the United States of America. Why is it the most competitive laboratory? because the best minds, the best brains, the most ambitious people from all over the world find some way to get the United States to succeed. And guess what? You know what's the outcome in the most competitive human laboratory in the world? And in an article for McKinsey, I said, quote, it is so easy to grasp the gap between India's potential and its performance because you can see the potential of what an ethnic Indian can do in the most competitive human laboratory in the world, which is the United States of America. And when the Indians arrived in America, they thought they might be number five or number six in terms of per capita income. The Indians ended up being number one. So today, the average per capita income of the Indian residing in the United States is US $55,298. If Indians in India can achieve the same per capita income as Indians in the United States, the total GNP of India will be around $71 trillion, making it the largest economy in the world, larger than the United States, which only has 21 trillion, or even China, which only has 15 trillion. Now, if this figure is unimaginable, let's imagine that the average Indian in India is half as smart as the average Indian in the US, that India would still have a GNP of uh, US 35 trillion, again, larger than that of the United States of 21 trillion and China at 15 trillion. Why do I highlight all these figures? I do so because I only want to emphasize one 
big point which I hope you'll take away from this lecture, which is that the country with the biggest gap between its economic potential and its economic performance is India. India's GNP today is about $2.6 trillion. It should be at least 10 or 20 times larger than that which is today. Now, let me deal with one objection immediately. The argument can be made that it was the super smart Indians that ended up in the US, hence they ended up with the super high per capita incomes. Now, even if I acknowledge that this is true, how about comparing the per capita income of Indians in India, in India with Indians in other economies? Now, I don't have the data for all the bits of all overseas Indian communities, but I travel around the world. I've gone to most of the major countries in the world, and I've seen how successful the Indian communities are all around the world. And there's so much evidence that Indians just thrive and do well. So why do Indians thrive when they're outside India? Now, the answer could be complex, but let me mention one key factor. Indians are naturally competitive economic animals and thrive in economic competition. And in this regard, by the way, they're very similar to the Chinese. And this brings me to the second important point I want to emphasize in my lecture, how the economic fortunes of the Chinese turn after the key reformist leader of China, Deng Xiaoping, asked a very simple question. Deng Xiaoping asked the question. He said, why are the Chinese successful in every country in the world, but not in China? And so he came to the obvious answer. The Chinese are succeeding overseas because they're competing economically in every other country in the world, but they're not competing economically in China. So Deng Xiaoping did the obvious thing. He opened up the Chinese economy, exposed 1.4 billion Chinese to economic competition around 1980, and you've seen the results. So what are the results? Now in 1980 is a significant year because in 1980, the size of the Chinese economy, which was $191 billion, was almost the same size as the Indian economy, which was $186 billion. Same size, 1980. Today, the size of the Chinese economy is, as I mentioned earlier, $15 trillion, over five times that of India's economy, so which is, $2.6 trillion. So the obvious question to ask is, how did India go from having an economy the same size as China's to having an economy one-fifth that of China? And the answer is amazingly simple. China opened its economy to global economic competition and allowed 1.4 billion Chinese to compete and since the Chinese thrive in economic competition, the Chinese economy thrived and surged ahead. By contrast, this is the big contrast, the 1.3 billion Indians have been deprived of economic competition. And since they've been deprived of economic competition, they cannot thrive. Hence, India's economy has fallen behind. Let me add another important point here, okay? I want to make it clear, I'm not just comparing India with China. India's economy has also fallen behind that of other regions and countries. As you know, I come from Southeast Asia. Of the 10 countries in Southeast Asia, nine have an Indic cultural base. So you could say in some ways, these nine countries are cultural satellites of India. And the total population of ASEAN is only 650 million, half of that of India's. But the combined GNP of ASEAN countries with half the population, which is about 3 trillion, which is larger than that of India's, right? But another statistic, frankly, and here, as you say, I'm going to say uncomfortable points, I'm sorry. Another statistic is more shocking. 
in 1971, when India helped Bangladesh to become an independent country, many commentators said that Bangladesh was a hopeless economy. In fact, Henry Kissinger said it's an economic basket case. And indeed, when I served as ambassador to the UN from 84 to 89, 98 to 2004, Bangladesh was a member of what was a club called the Least Developed Countries, and India was never a member of the club of Least Developed Countries. And, but today, the latest figures in 2020, the per capita income of Bangladesh has become higher than that of India's. So the obvious question is, why have the ASEAN countries, why have Bangladesh outperformed? And the answer is that these countries have plunged into global economic competition and India has it. So all this therefore brings me to part two of my lecture. What are the principles that India should follow to become the largest economy in the world? And I want to keep emphasizing that India has the potential to become the largest economy in the world. And of course, my broad answer, you can probably guess it by now, is that India needs to unleash the vibrant animal spirits of the 1.3 billion Indian people by exposing them to global economic competition. And the question is, what are the principles to follow? Now, before telling you what the principles are, let me emphasize one thing, okay? This is not gonna be easy. No big achievements in life are ever easy. They'll be difficult. There'll be many political, economic, bureaucratic, psychological, vested interests, obstacles that have to be overcome. And since I mentioned earlier how China had succeeded, let me emphasize that China also didn't have an easy time when it, when it transformed itself. And actually I was president at the World Economic Forum Davos meeting in 2017 when President Xi Jinping of China admitted openly that the process of opening up the Chinese economy was a very difficult one. And this is what he said, quote, there was a time when China also had doubts about economic globalization and was not sure whether it should join the World Trade Organization. But we came to the conclusion that the integration into the global economy is a historical trend to grow its economy. China must have the courage. And please listen to this. Eh? Must have the courage to swim in the vast ocean of the global market and he added, if one, if one is always afraid of bracing the storm and exploring the new world, he will sooner or later get drowned in the ocean. Therefore, China took a brave step to embrace the global market. And then he added, we've had our fair share of choking in the water and encountering whirlpools, choppy waves, but we have learned how to swim in the process and it has proven to be the right strategic choice, unquote. So I want to emphasize a key point. Changing costs for India will not be easier. Like China, India will also have to struggle to swim when it plunges into the ocean of globalization. And what will make it even more difficult, and this is the difficult part, India will have to follow two contradictory principles in trying to open up its economy to global competition. The first principle is to have a radical change of mindset and decide that an open Indian economy will do much better than a closed Indian economy. And the second principle is that when opening up the Indian economy, India should do it very carefully and pragmatically. We should not try a big bang approach or shock therapy as the experience of Russia and Eastern Europe have shown that big bang approaches don't work. And so you can see these are two contradictory principles. On the one hand, plunge into global economic globalization. On the other hand, do it cautiously and pragmatically. It'd be difficult. And I wanna emphasize that it'll be difficult. 
Now, but the radical change of mindset is very important because the general assumption of many in India, sorry to say this, is that the best way to protect the poor in India is to keep the Indian economy as close as possible. Hence, the intentions of those who trying to keep the Indian economy close was noble to protect the poor. However, the record of recent history shows that poverty reduction happens much faster when economies open up faster. And frankly, there's so many countries that provide evidence of this. And the best example, the best recent example is that of Vietnam, which as you know, for many years, a close ally of the Soviet Union had a close Soviet style economy. When the Cold War ended, Vietnam decided to join his fellow East Asian countries in opening up its economy. And the results of poverty reduction in Vietnam were absolutely spectacular. As the then World Bank president, uh, Jim Yong Kim pointed out, in 2016, Vietnam's average growth rate of nearly 7% over the previous 25 years had enabled the country to leapfrog the middle income status in one generation. And during the same period, Kim noted, Vietnam had managed a especially remarkable achievement of reducing extreme poverty from 50% to just 3%. Let me repeat that. From 50% extreme poverty to 3%. How did Vietnam do it? Open up its economy. And you see the results. So let me, let me, let me use a simple metaphor to explain why opening up the Indian economy helps the poor. The main reason why I emphasize the super performance of Indians overseas is to point out that we should view Indians dif differently. We should see them as 1.3 million economic tigers poised to perform well. And what's the best way to get tigers to perform well? Keep them in cages? or zoos, or where they have limited competition and limited room to grow, or release these tigers into the wild jungle where they can roam freely and become strong and fierce. Now, you know, when you listen to a 45 minute lecture, one hour lecture, a few days later, when you're trying to remember, what is it I remember about the lecture I heard 45 minutes ago, if there's one plea I have to you, just remember this. India is a country of 1.3 billion economic tigers. If you unleash them, you get the largest economy in the world immediately. Now I'm using this matter for economic tigers to drive home the essential point that generations of Indian policy makers have made a major mistake by underestimating the ability of Indians to compete. This is why relative to most East Asian economies, the Indian economy is relatively close. Now for those who doubt my statement that the Indian economy is relatively close, let me give you some statistics. A relatively open economy trades more with the world. A relatively closed economy trades less with the world. And here's the data. China and India have about the same population. Yet China's total trade with the world, 4.5 trillion, is more than five times that of India, which is about 800 billion dollars. 800 billion. So you can see China's GNP is five times India's GNP. China's trade is five times India's trade. That's an indicator of openness. But what's even more shocking is that the population of ASEAN, as I said, is half that of India's. The total trade of ASEAN, which is $2.8 trillion, is also more than three times that of India. So clearly opening up the economy makes a huge difference. So, but let me acknowledge an important point here. When India opens up its economy, there will be creative destruction as pointed out by the famous economist, Joseph Shampita. But creative destruction is good. 
it destroys the inefficient parts of the economy and strengthen the efficient parts of the economy. Let me give you an example. Before China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, the state-owned enterprises made up two-thirds of the Chinese economy. Today, they make up one-third. So half were destroyed, the state-owned enterprises. And that was a good thing, because that made China more competitive. And I want to add an important point, uh, just to emphasize one thing. It wasn't easy for China to open up its economy. Uh, just a few days ago, uh, so a few weeks ago, I interviewed uh, the former foreign minister of Singapore, Mr. Giorgio, a very good friend of India. And he says, and I quote, huh? he says, I was in Doha when China was admitted to the WTO in November 2001. There was great celebration. But he said the Chinese at the time felt very bruised by the negotiating process because the US working in concert with the Europeans and the Japanese extracted the maximum number of concessions from China. And Giorgio says, I remember later suggesting to China that they should join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And the economic minister of China held out his hands and said, we have given up so much when we open up our economy. Uh, and so we cannot open up anymore. And yet, as a result of opening up China's economy, this is what Giorgio says, Chinese economy grew up, grew seven times in PPP terms in 20 years, nine times in renminbi terms, and 11 times in US dollar terms. That's what happens when you open up. Now, since this lecture is named after Mr. K.R. Narayanan, I want to pause and hear and quote a sentence from him. Now, you all may know that one of the most famous things that Mr. K.R. Narayanan did was to write the telegram, that, the secret telegram after the Chinese nuclear explosion, which has now been released publicly. And in that memo, he makes a very striking comparison, Mr. K.R. Narayanan does, between the economies of China and India. And this he said, he said in the man, secret memo, he said this, he's quote, I quote, the left wing of the CPI, Communist Party of India, has already begun to highlight before the people the spectacular progress made by socialist China as compared to capitalist India, unquote. This is a sentence from Mr. K.R. Narayanan's uh, secret lecture, sorry, secret memo. Now, it is true in 1964, it was absolutely true that India was capitalist and China wasn't. Now, 57 years have passed. Today, China is not just more capitalist than India. China is more capitalist than the United States of America. Now, this is not me saying this. This is uh, Dr. Shan Wei Jian. He received his PhD in economics from Berkeley. He's, by the way, his PhD supervisor was Janet Yellen, who's now the current Treasury Secretary uh, of the US. And this is what I quote from Shan Wei Jian. Shan Wei Jian says, Americans don't know how capitalist China is. China's rapid economic growth is the result of the embrace of a market, market economy and private enterprise. China is among the most open markets in the world. It's the largest trading nation and also the, also the largest recipient of foreign direct investment surpassing the United States in 2020. The major focus of government expenditure is domestic infrastructure. China now has better highways, rail systems, bridges, and airports than the United States does. Then he adds to the other side, he says, the Chinese don't know how socialist America is with its social security system and its policies to tax the rich by collecting capital, capital gains taxes. China is still in the process of building a social safety net that is largely undefined and underfunded. It has no tax on personal capital gains. And so in 2020, China had more billionaires than the US did and it outpaces the US three to one in minting billionaires. So that's interesting. In 1964, Mr. K.R. Narayan said that India was capitalist, China was socialist. 57 years later, China is now more capitalist than the United States of America. That's how the world has changed. And this is also explains, by the way, why it is almost inevitable that China will overtake the US and become the number one economy in the world within 10 years. But it also explains how India can overtake both China and the United States 
and become the number one economy in 20 to 30 years. It should open up its economy, trade more with the rest of the world, and allow, frankly, more creative destruction to take place within the inefficient sectors. Hence, the theoretical direction that India should take to make its economy stronger is very clear. However, as I indicated earlier, while I advocate one principle of big fundamental changes, the second principle is that when you apply this theory, practice, you've got to be very cautious. And we saw what happened to Russia and the East European economies when they thought they were doing the right thing by opening up their economies with a big bang. And sadly, many of them suffered very badly. So I'm going to mention this. I won't go into great detail, uh, but you should know that in opening up an economy, you've got to do it slowly and carefully. And in some ways, that's also what uh, China did because they heeded the advice of Deng Xiaoping, who said, who advised that India should grow, who grow, advised that China should grow for stones to cross the river steadily. You, therefore, you, when you make the transition, do it slowly, carefully. But at the same time, you can also do it with some concrete steps. So all this brings me to part three of my uh, remarks and talk about a few concrete steps. And I believe to use another metaphor, there are some low hanging fruit that India can take to transform its economy uh, quickly. Of course, there'll be risks huh, with anything I suggest. Anything I suggest has risks. If it doesn't have risks, what difference will it make? It must have risks. It must be difficult. And so well, there are three steps, I think, where India can make calculated risks and therefore transform its economy. And there are three steps, there are three examples of low hanging fruit. And by the way, each of these will be controversial in somebody's eyes or another. And the first step in my view is the easy one. Join the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP immediately. Why join the RCEP? Very simple, many reasons. Firstly, in today's world, let's be very blunt. Europe represents the past. America represents the present. East Asia represents the future. So by joining RCEP, India will be betting on the future, not the past. And secondly, with a total population of $2.3 billion and a combined GDP of $38 trillion, RCEP can provide the biggest market for Indian products. And here's one statistic that explains how the, the markets in East Asia are growing faster than any markets anywhere in the rest of the world. In 2009, the size of the retail goods market in China was 1.8 trillion, while that of the US was 4 trillion, twice the size of China's. By 2019, 2019 is a significant year. This is three years after Trump beat up China with trade tariffs, trade sanctions. As a result of that, China's retail goods market became $6 trillion, while that of the US was $5.5 trillion. And the third reason why India should join the RCP immediately is that India spent many years negotiating its entry into RCEP. And the friends of India, Japan, Australia, Singapore, were very keen that India join RCEP. And in fact, delayed the conclusion to allow India time to join the RCEP. And so many of India's concerns have already been met in the RCEP. But I suspect, so why hasn't India joined? So I suspect that clearly some vested interests somewhere are going to be upset when India joins the RCEP. And so this is, at the end of the day, the big dilemma. Do you want to, in a sense, put the national interests of India, which will benefit from joining the RCEP or the interests of a few vested interests. And I believe that any calculation will show, any economic calculation will show that if India joins the RCEP, the Indian economy will benefit and become stronger at the process. And let me add, let me add an important point here. I've spoken about creative destruction. RCEP will give a huge jolt to the Indian economy. But a huge jolt is what the Indian economy needs. If you're going to catapult yourself to become the largest economy in the world. 
So that's one easy step. Now, the second concrete step that India can take is to make the South Asian region, by that I mean all the SARC members, as open as the Southeast Asian region. I discovered one thing, you know, after 50 years of working life, that in many areas, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If there's a problem, somebody somewhere has solved it. And, and frankly, the best way for any, any way for any economy to grow is to open its economy to its neighbors. And just look at the European Union, look at NAFTA. So all that South, South, South Asia can do is to open up its economy. It doesn't have to be op as open as the European Union. It doesn't have to be as open as NAFTA, but it can be as open as ASEAN. So, and so all that South Asia has to do, frankly, is very easy. Pick up a copy of the ASEAN Free Trade Area Agreement and just replicate it. That's all. Just replicate it. And then, boom, trade will grow. Now, let me add an important point here. I'm not politically naive. I'm aware that there are problems within India and some of its neighbors, especially within India and Pakistan. And as you know, India and Pakistan don't even have normal trade with each other. But here, let me add, therefore, another Southeast Asian story that is relevant. India and Pakistan fought their last major war in 1971. China and Vietnam, who had been suspicious of each other for 2,000 years, and China occupied Vietnam for 1,000 years. These two countries fought a major war more recently, in 1979. But after Vietnam joined ASEAN, with whom we've been quarreling also, it also joined the China ASEAN Free Trade Agreement. And so as a consequence, since the mid 1990s, trade between Vietnam and China, trade between Vietnam and China, these are two major adversarial nations, huh? India and China, uh, Vietnam and China, major adversarial nations, that trade has grown 3000 times. And who benefits from this increased trade? Now you know why Vietnam had a more successful poverty reduction program when trade grows 3,000 times. And you can trade with your adversaries too. And the poor people anywhere in South Asia would benefit from an explosion of trade. Now the third concrete step, and I'm gonna end with this third point. So uh, I'll be ending in two, three minutes. The third concrete step India can take is to open its doors to foreign direct investment again following the uh, countries of Southeast Asia. And here's one statistic that I think is worth reflecting on. The combined GNP of the most dynamic Northeast Asian economies, huh? China, Japan, South Korea have the biggest economies in East Asia. The total combined GNP is $21 trillion. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the combined GNP of ASEAN is only 3 trillion. 21 trillion for China, Japan, South Korea, 3 trillion for ASEAN, so much smaller, right? And yet, this smaller region, ASEAN, has more American investment than Northeast Asia, right? So in Northeast Asia with the 21 trillion GNP, they only got $287 billion of American investment. Southeast Asia has had $335 billion of American investment. The poorer region got more investment. So therefore, South Asia can also get it. Now, and here, let me add an important geopolitical point here. You all know that a major geopolitical contest has broken out between US and China. And I documented in my book, Has China Won, which you see behind my shoulder. It is a fact <laughs> that many American manufacturers are looking for something which is called a China plus one destination. They, are, they will invest in China, but they don't want to invest. They don't put all the eggs in China. They want looking for someplace else to put their eggs. And obviously, many of these American investors want to invest in India. But unfortunately, as soon as they arrive in India, they encounter Indian bureaucracy and they get discouraged. So this is my simple suggestion. Many of the Southeast Asian economies, uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, went from being closed to becoming open. 
So they all develop investment brochures, investment rules. All that, all that South Asian countries in Green India have to do is just copy them, copy these investment brochures. And that, that we, there's a tremendous desire to invest in India today. And, and if all that India has to do is open the doors and the investment will come. So you can see my conclusion, therefore, is that it will not take rocket science to make India's economy the largest in the world and larger even than that of China and the US. It will only take, basically what I'm sharing with you is simple common sense. There's no need to invent anything new. For a start, India can learn from the Southeast Asian countries, whom I explained, as I said earlier, have had relations with India for 2000 years. And, and so to conclude, let me quote what Prime Minister Manmohan Singh said, he called on India to look East. Prime Minister Narendra Modi called on India to act East. My message is a much simpler one. Please come to Southeast Asia and learn from the East and then India will have the largest economy in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rakhubani. Now I invite Professor Ramakumar for his comments. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dimpi. And uh, it was quite uh, fascinating to listen to uh, Professor Mehbubani's uh, talk, where he compared the potentials and possibilities for two largest demographies of the world, may I say. It's not an easy comparison to make. The two countries have a very long history. Uh, if you look at uh, data for the 18th century, you will see that uh, both these countries together possibly contributed to something like 40% uh, or 42% of the global GDP as well as global manufacturing. So they were in some sense the manufacturing powerhouses of the world uh, about two to 300 years back. Then came the industrial revolution of Europe, colonialism in Asia, and both these countries were pushed back by at least two centuries, and you see that uh, their combined contribution comes down to only about eight to 10% by 1950. So here are two great countries of the world, two great cultures of the world, two very significant societies of the world, beginning their journey of development together, roughly about 70 years back. Certainly they have diverse experiences of development over the last 70 years. Much has happened in this period in global political economy, in geopolitics, in bilateral relations and so on. The two countries have even fought a war. There are contentious issues in the border, but there is an underlying feeling for sure that these two countries have to hold hands together looking at the future that is tomorrow. And in that sense, Professor Mehbubani's call for India to be like China is quite spot on. And I have no quarrel at all with that positioning of his argument. But I would like to diverge a little bit from what he said. And I would like to make this larger point that maybe at some level, there was an oversimplification of the challenge in front of us. And it appeared to me that Professor Mabubani was suggesting that a simple open trade policy or a simple free market regime would actually take India to where China is now. But I do not, I think I agree with that kind of uh, an oversimplification, that's my term, uh, of uh, 
a rather complex issue, which is uh, uh, which is also inflicted with a number of questions related to history, path dependence, and contemporary global challenges. What am I trying to say? If you look at the Chinese and Indian paths of development after 1948 or 47, you will see that there is a slow divergence between the two countries, say if you take per capita income as an indicator, till about 1978. And after 1978, you will see that there is a very sharp divergence. What was a slow divergence becomes a very sharp divergence between China and India in terms of per capita income as the overarching indicator. Let's begin with the slow divergence point because history is important. This period covers uh, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, or about th three decades of very important time uh, for these two countries in the initial stages. What did China do in these initial 30 years or so? It made very important interventions, which were historic in some sense, in the fields of, and I'm not, I'm not going to list out all, I'm going to have very short time, so I'm going to uh, summarize things a little bit uh, here. It had a very exhaustive land reform to begin with, which meant that the feudal system of land relations that existed in China was smashed completely, and the space was opened up for a more open development of agriculture. Incentives were opened up, at least in a limited extent for agriculturists to respond to different policy initiatives. The weakening of landlordism meant that different kinds of freedoms enjoyed by people expanded considerably in the rural areas. There was some amount of agricultural growth for sure. And this land reform in some sense laid the foundation for China's future developmental successes. China's future develop China's developmental successes would have been a complete non-starter if it were not for its exhaustive land reform. The second important uh, change that you see uh, in China is uh, with respect to education and health. Now, what did land reform do? It sort of mobilized peasants under collective forms of land use. On the one hand, there was significant public investment in irrigation, rural infrastructure. And it's important that this, these were not simply initial conditions. One of the major achievements of this policy was to evolve over time a system of farm management that sought to ensure a rational use of labor, natural resources, and capital, as well as share risks. And that was very important. Come to education and health. Average life expectancy in, uh, in China rose from close to 40 years in 1949 to about 65 years in 1978. Uh, primary health care became widely accessible in this period, especially for mothers and children in rural areas. Infant mortality fell from close to about 250 per thousand in 1950 to about 40 to 50 per thousand in 1980. Literacy rates expanded uh, considerably. Primary school enrollment rose considerably. It was already 90% uh, in a few, year, a few decades. So all these meant that in terms of land reform, education, health, and creation of large infrastructure, China made phenomenal advances in the first 30 years, which laid a concrete foundation for its future development success. What did India do? In all these four respects, India miserably failed. It was not because, as some people call it, India had a socialist economic policy during this period. India neither had a socialist economic policy nor had a capitalist economic policy during this time. It had a very strange mix of a, of a mixed economy, but one in which it failed to contain landlordism in rural areas. It failed to expand education. Even today, even today, only about 75% of the Indian population can read and write. Uh, you have 
a complete a, a health system which is in shambles. COVID has exposed it uh, so well. You have 60% of the Indian women who are anemic. You have one third of India's children who are either underweight or stunted. And these are challenges that continue to remain even after 70 years, but one which China had probably dealt with in the first 30 years of its development itself. So all these have made a considerable difference to where these two countries are today. And I think these are aspects which, unfortunately, Professor Mehbubani did not mention in his uh, uh, very interesting speech. Now, he spoke a lot about creative destruction. What is the original creative destruction in countries like India and China as they existed or, uh, or as they were uh, in terms of the developmental trajectory in 1950? Land reform. Land reform was and is the creative destruction in the Schumpeterian sense. And China succeeded there. India has almost forgotten this chapter. Now, come to the post-1978 period. Here is where the sharp divergence begins. And this is also a time where you start talking about the dragon and elephant comparisons, as uh, many scholars uh, usually do. Uh, according to uh, Robin Meredith, who wrote a book on that recently, uh, he said, uh, India, the elephant is slow, but it will reach the destination. But China, the dragon is super fast, but it's not as strong as it appears. But going by its achievements over these years, the dragon has obviously achieved tremendously, whereas the elephant continues to drag on. Now, this period sees China catapulting itself into a global power in about 30 years or 35 years uh, after 1978. It enormously expanded its domestic market. It en enormously expanded domestic consumption. If domestic consumption grew by 7 to 8% in China during this time, in India, it was growing only at about 2% or so in this, in this time. And it enormously increased gross capital formation as a share of the GDP. Its savings rate touched very close to 40%. Its banking system expanded enormously. And the four modernizations stand apart. The modernization of agriculture, of industry, of science, and of technology. No doubt about it. I'm not talking about defense here, which is another modernization, but I'm not dealing with that at this point of time. But this post-1978 policy in China is often uh, not contrasted, but seen as parallel with the so-called Washington Consensus ideology that came from the West. But if there is a policy path which used markets but was certainly not the Washington Consensus, it was China's. China became a true developmental state, to use uh, the terms used by Professor Amir Kumar Bakshi or Carl Riskin and so on. China was a true developmental state in this time. But on the contrast, India was not one. I'll come to that in a while, but after completing a small point here, why do I say that while it looks like a Washington consensus reform and was often made out to be so by many from the West, it is not actually so. And that we know from the works of Alice Amston and all or from Korea. We already have those examples from East Asia, but that's very much true and more so in China as compared to the East Asian success stories that we know. If you look at uh, China and ask the question, did it embrace a free market regime? Take agriculture after 1978. That would be to deny the fundamentally socialist character of Chinese agriculture even after 1978, even though it uh, ended the collective systems and, ended, and, and began the household responsibility systems. First, even under the household responsibility system, land in China has continued to remain under collective ownership and production is only under contract from the state. So if Washington consensus puts forward property rights as the epitome of a free economic policy, China precisely did not do that. It kept land nationalized, just as 
Professor Mehbubani, Singapore has done in a very different way. But that's a different story. I'm not comparing Singapore. I'm not bringing Singapore at all into this comparison here. We're talking about China and India. So land and collective ownership on the one hand. Secondly, the collectives in China continued to manage, even under household responsibility, things like plowing, seeding, irrigation, water conservation, etc. And finally, there were accumulation funds for rural areas and so on, where peasants continued to contribute even after 1978. So what you see in China is a very peculiar combination of the instruments of state and market, and certainly not Washington consensus type. And it certainly, of course, is not of the classical socialist type because it has brought in the market in a very important way, but not in a dogmatic sense, not in a textbook sense, but in a very different way. And that's something that we need to understand more from China. And that nuance, I think, I missed a little bit in Professor Mehbubani's uh, presentation. As the East Asian experience has shown us, such a combination of instruments of state and market could be a potential powerful driver of growth in an era of expanding world trade. In China, however, the range of instruments used by the state was far wider than what South Korea or Taiwan governments used or what the Washington consensus has prescribed. So the new regime in China, that's my point, was thus erected on the shoulders of the old and represented a distinctive symbiosis of the old and the new, the state and the market, the pre-1978 and post-1978. And that characterization, that symbiosis, is very important to grasp with all the differences and nuances if we want to understand China in a real sense. That's the other point I wanted to make. Markets have been there, but they have been very strictly and powerfully regulated. And this is what has allowed China to successfully complete the so-called structural transformation, which India is continuing to grapple with even after 70 years. This is how a true developmental state has became a reality of public policy in China. Whereas in contrast in India, because you, you did none of the things that a typical developmental state is supposed to do, you had this process of developmental state formation as more half-hearted, fragmented, inadequate, incomplete, weak, and so on. Political scientists have called it as India being a soft state and so on. I'm not getting into those uh, uh, funky terms at this point of time, but certainly the process of developmental state formation was weak and inadequate. Economic reforms came in India after 1991, but here again, you basically see it threw the baby out with the bathwater. It withdrew the state completely from very critical spheres of the economy, strategic spheres of the economy, and it basically opened everything to the market. In fact, many like uh, Atul Kohli, the political scientist would argue that Indian policies were not even market friendly, were actually business friendly. And there's a clear difference between what is market friendly and what is business friendly, because business friendly means more of cronyism in the way capitalism uh, evolves in your society and economy. You have over the last 10 years, if you see, Everything that is central to the economy breaking down in India. Investment rate is collapsing. Uh, so basically you have a sharp fall of investment rate, savings rate, exports, bank credit, employment, et cetera. On the one hand, China is trying to, has already succeeded in eliminating chronic poverty, while India uh, continues to be home to 33% of the world's extreme poor. And uh, one fourth of its population is certainly poor by any standard. Counter examples that are there in India. That's where I want to bring in the state which is hosting you today, Kerala. This is the counter example to the Indian developmental path, which began with land reform, whose educational and health indicators are comparable to Scandinavian countries today, and which has brought about enormous amount of community involvement in the process of development through uh, unleashing the powers of cooperation through unleashing the powers of people-centric uh, panchayat level planning and so on, you have, a, you have an alternative 
which uh, the state of Kerala appears to have shown to the uh, country where on what actually a developmental state is supposed to do and what its potentials and possibilities might actually be. Now, so this is the point that I wanted to uh, make uh, broadly. Uh, opening up of the economy in India is, is, is fine, but does India have the competitiveness or is it ready for that kind of opening up? Does it have the education, the skill, the kind of healthy workforce, etc., which is actually a fundamental necessity for maintaining competitiveness in an open economy? Does it have a concrete social security system uh, to help and support the poor who might fall back in such a circumstance of opening up? The answer to all of this is a very uh, clear, unambiguous no. And that is why there is enormous resistance in India to uh, treaties like RCEP. It is, I've seen uh, that you, you mentioned that it's sometimes the Indian rich who is actually resisting RCEP. But don't forget that uh, we have a very large uh, uh, workforce in the dairy sector, small farmers who own two cows, three cows per house, household, etc., who were the vanguard of resistance against RCEP because they felt that uh, the imports of skim milk powder and milk from uh, New Zealand and Australia might actually destroy their very fragile livelihoods, which are already in great crisis. So the resistance to RCEP is not from the Indian rich. Maybe it is from Indian, Indian rich because they're scared of Chinese imports, I'm, I agree. But it is not just from them. It is certainly also from India's poor. And an example of that is uh, the millions of dairy farmers across the country uh, who have been the vanguard of that opposition. That's the point I wanted to make, uh, Professor Mehbubani. I didn't want to be as provocative as you were. Uh, it was lovely uh, listening to you. Uh, it was a very, uh, very, very meticulously argued point, but uh, I somehow felt that uh, uh, some of the nuances uh, of uh, history, uh, some of the uh, necessities in developmental processes that are fundamental to backward countries uh, like India and China from the 1950s onwards were possibly, uh, probably, missed out in the presentation. I just wanted to uh, bring that to the attention of the audience here. I look forward to the discussion with you. Thank you so much. Professor Mukhubhavad. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I must say I'm very impressed by uh, Professor Ramakumar. I did not give him an advanced copy of my speech, but he was able to respond uh, so clearly and so eloquently uh, to many of my points. And I uh, appreciate that very much. And, and, and I actually agree with uh, some of the key points you made. And you're absolutely right that in the period 1949 to 1979, there were major reforms that were carried out in China uh, by Mao Zedong Stein, Mao Zedong Stein in uh, land reform, in uh, healthcare, education, which in some ways laid the foundations uh, for China's uh, subsequent success. I agree with that, but also, as you know, that uh, China also went through hell in that period. Uh, they had the Great Leap Forward. Uh, they had the Cultural Revolution. I mean, India didn't have anything as traumatic as what China has suffered uh, uh, in that period. And also in your broader point about uh, there being nuances, I completely agree with you that there, there, there are lots of nuances. And I'm glad you, you, you made you uh, quoted Atul Kohli when he talked about market-friendly policies and business-friendly policies. And that's a very uh, important distinction because market-friendly policies actually help all of society. Business-friendly may actually help me help some segments of uh, society. But, but having said all that, in, even if you want to set aside and say, okay, okay, China, we cannot compete with, surely Southeast Asia, Surely you can get a per capita income higher than Bangladesh, surely. And, and, and if you can't even do that, if you fall behind Bangladesh, then frankly, there are some fundamental policies that are wrong in that uh, society. And if you can't even get as much foreign investment as uh, the ASEAN countries, and you know, the ASEAN countries, I can tell you, by the way, you want to add nuance? You want to understand how difficult situations these are in this, these countries are in? 
I mean, they started off from a much lower base than India did, by the way, you know. So they're starting off from a much lower base. They overtook India. So look at that nuance or so. Why is it countries that had bigger disadvantages than India overtook India and succeeded? And, and I would say this is where I want to emphasize, you can add all the nuance you want, but there's the most important variable is absolutely undeniable. The more you open up your economy to global competition, the better you do. The more you close your country to global competition, the worse you do. And there, there's, there's absolute, absolute correlation. And by the way, I would say, please stop referring to the Washington consensus. The Washington consensus should be actually be buried and killed. You know, it's it's rubbish basically. It's all it's all a ton of rubbish that was created by American economists, and it didn't work. Because I can tell you something: Americans can create a very successful economy in the United States of America, but you ask the Americans to run any other country in the world, you'll screw it up. Exhibit A: Afghanistan. How do you spend two trillion dollars? Okay. Two trillion dollars now. Huh? That's almost the size of India's GNP on one country and burn it and waste it all. That, that's all the Washington consensus stuff, okay? So we have to get out of this mindset of continuing to refer to all these Washington figures and American names because they all don't understand the world of Asia. And so if we in Asia want to prosper and succeed, Let's learn from fellow Asians. Forget the American, forget the European experience. It's not relevant to us. They had very different circumstances and they overcame it all. And incidentally, uh, the United States in a, is in structurally having lots of problems uh, because as I document in my book of the creation of a plutocracy, they have their own issues and challenges. So, but here we are in Asia, a lot of us are developing countries, a lot of us have a very difficult uh, starting point, and many of us have succeeded. So all we need to do is copy from each other, copy from each other. And if the ASEAN countries can open up and trade with the world, India can open up and trade with the world because India has got tremendous uh, competitive advantages. And India also is the, as far as I know, has the most globalized community in the world. There's only one country that probably has business communities in every city of the world, that's India. You know, maybe Lebanon may have some of it, I suspect. But, you know, that's a tremendous competitive advantage. So the, the, you've got to understand, okay, given all these difficulties, what are the opportunities that India has? And the opportunities India has, and I want to emphasize and close with this point, are far greater than any country in the world. So if I was an Indian policymaker, I would focus on the opportunities seize the opportunities and let's move on. And we have a question from Dr. Sri Kumar and he's asking, what are the key challenges and opportunities of economic relations between India and China in the age of privatization? Well, I think, you know, relations with India and China today are very difficult. Okay? I mean, let's be very clear about that. I think uh, Professor Ramakumar uh, alluded to that or so. So it, it, the, the relations are very difficult. And, and that's why I, I, I frankly don't think that uh, uh, collaboration between China and India is the answer to India's uh, uh, challenges and opportunities. There are many other uh, countries that, uh, that, that India can collaborate with. And I would say the first source of growth for any country is its immediate neighborhood. And I've seen some studies that show that all you have to do is just create normal trading relations with India and Pakistan. No, nothing special, just normal, normal, normal trading relations. Pakistan GNP will go up 2, 3%, India's GNP will go up 1%, something like that. I mean, that's something basic is that. And similarly, I mean, look at ASEAN and, and, and Southeast Asia, okay? Uh, look at the trade, you know, uh, in the year 2000, let me give you one statistic. China's trade with Southeast Asia was $40 billion. And United States trade with Southeast Asia was $130 billion, three times that of China uh, and ASEAN. By 2020, 20 years of that later, US trade with ASEAN went up three times to uh, three, over $300 billion, right? And uh, China's trade with ASEAN went to over $600 billion. <laughs> 
So, I mean, you're talking about spectacular increases in trade. And so, we, you know, so you know, in many ways, if India can collaborate with its own neighborhood, if India can collaborate with Southeast Asia, and frankly, also with the Middle East, you can, you can grow your economy. So there are opportunities out there. But I would say, given the political difficulties today between China and India, I don't see much uh, opportunities for collaboration between China and India until and unless we can overcome the present difficult period. So uh, Gaurav Kumar is asking, how can India transform from a reluctant socialism to a developmental capitalism? And also he's asking, how can India hide and bite till its emergence to an economic preeminence? <laughs> well, two very challenging questions. You know, I find, frankly, that labels like socialism, capitalism, all, frankly, have become less and less useful. As I, as I told you, I quoted in great detail what Dr. Shan Weijian said. And the paradox is that China is supposed to be socialist, uh, America is supposed to be capitalist, but as I gave you in the data in my speech, China today is in many ways more capitalist than the United States is, which is a, a paradox. So don't set aside the labels and focus on the concrete things that need to be done to rejuvenate and strengthen uh, the Indian economy. So for example, right, let me just give you a simple concrete example. There are so many American investors who want to come and invest in India. I know this. I've spoken to some of them. They want to come and invest in India. And what's the problem? Bureaucratic obstacles. And, and the point is, these, these, these same American investors, they go to Thailand, they go to Vietnam, they go to Malaysia, they go to Indonesia, and they find ways and means of investing. But they can't overcome the bureaucratic obstacles in India. So, you know, this is, this, this is why I want to go back to my key image, huh? that India is a country of 1.3 billion economic tigers. <laughs> These tigers can really perform very well, but you've got to get rid of the bureaucratic obstacles that are standing in their way. And one of the bureaucratic obstacles standing in the way is of course the obstacles of foreign investment uh, in India, and, and that can be removed. So think about what can be removed to actually get India more integrated with the global economy, and that should be the target and India should definitely try to achieve at least the level of global trade that Southeast Asia has achieved uh, with the rest of the world. That can be done. Now, on the hide and bite issue, that, that's, that was something that was, the, the, in case anyone is asking, wants to know what is hide and bite. <laughs> hide and bite refers to the foreign policy of Deng Xiaoping when he opened up China's economy. He said, we now, in the next 20, 20, 30 years, focus on our economic development and therefore don't get involved in any foreign policy disputes at all. And in fact, he added, he said, China should swallow bitter humiliation, accept all the insults, don't get involved in struggles, just focus on economic development. Now, that, that's, that's easier for China to do because China, as you know, is run by the Communist Party of China. India is the world's largest democracy. The world's largest democracy, you cannot hide and bite. If any politician doesn't respond to any insult from outside, he'll be attacked in the Indian parliament. So it's much harder for India to carry out any hide and bite because in the Indian parliament, in the Indian media, everything will come out. But having said that, I also want to add that I think Indian uh, media should be a bit more responsible uh, in the way that it reports and covers uh, the rest of the world, the Indian press coverage on, 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 on China and, and in fact in other countries can be quite atrocious. Uh, and it's important to have a certain degree of rationality and objectivity uh, in dealing uh, with the rest of the world. So you, you cannot go the full spring all the way of hide and bite, but you can at least try to be a bit more careful in managing relations with all, with all the countries, including all the neighbors. And also, frankly, if the Southeast Asian, Southeast Asia is by far the most diverse corner of planet Earth. Out of 650 million people, you have 250 million Muslims, 150 million Christians, 150 million Buddhists, Mahayana Buddhists, Hinayana Buddhists, you have Taoists, Confucianists, Hindus, Communists. This diverse region of the planet Earth is, is at peace. So why can't South Asia, which is far less diverse than Southeast Asia, 
Why can't you just be as peaceful as ASEAN? You can be done. So this is the, these are the areas where I think it's very important for South Asia to learn from Southeast Asia and therefore create a more peaceful and prosperous environment for its people. Sir, Pramod Dev is asking, like, should we go for a regional integration model or a global integration model of opening up to the world? And is there still a scope for global integration of this kind offered by WTO, given the opposition to WTO by countries like USA? Uh, yeah. Maybe there's a question on uh, cultural homogenization, which you might be able to, uh, you might want to pick up and say something, uh, because that's a very different question. And, and, and uh, she says, my question is whether uh, Chinese government's policies on cultural homogenization to facilitate uh, economic development is a reason behind its success. Uh, basically, I think she's referring to uh, the whole question of Uyghurs and uh, uh, the other questions that uh, are in discussion very much with respect to China. No, no, I think both, both are, uh, let me answer both of them, cultural homogenization uh, as well about regional integration versus global integration. And I want to emphasize one point that regional integration and global integration are not uh, contradictory. <laughs> you can have regional integration and you can have global integration and both can go hand in hand. And, and it's very easy to, to look at the benchmarks, okay? You know, there, there, there are various benchmarks around the world. Clearly the most regionally integrated in the world is uh, region in the world is the European Union. Now, it will take us a long time to get to where the European Union is, okay? They allow free movement of people across borders and so on and so forth. We won't get there. So that's not, let's not use that as a benchmark. But if you look at what Southeast Asia has done and, and uh, how it is, the regional integration it has done, that the amount of trade that is increased, that's a level that uh, India can get, can get to. And at the same time, on the, on the WTO and the United States of America, it's true that the United States has changed its attitudes towards the WTO. But I think to be fair, the United States still remains one of the most open economies in the world. Okay, let's be very clear about that. Overall, the United States economy is still far more open than the Chinese economy. Let's be very clear about that. So the United States is, is really, for all its issues, is very open a uh, global economy and, 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 and it's, it will not, in, in a sense, while it has concerns about some aspects of the WTO, it's not gonna turn the clock and, and, and reverse global trade. So that I would say is not an issue for India. India can succeed in both these areas. Now on the other question of uh, homogenization, of course, China is a much more homogenized country uh, than, than mostly mo um, most major countries in the world. The vast majority of the people are uh, Han Chinese people and the, the number of people who are Uyghurs or, or Tibetans are mighty, very, very small, very, very small constituency. And it's, they're not, neither Xinjiang nor Tibet are key players in China's uh, economic growth uh, and development. But I want to emphasize a key point for every Indian should know. If you look at the past, even, 2000 years of Chinese history, China has been divided more often than it has been united. In fact, keeping China together as one country every day is an achievement. It's a huge country. Similarly, it's a huge achievement to keep India together every day, 1.3 billion people too. So, so it, China does have some major domestic challenges. It is not as though the, the, the path for China's success was easy just because it's culturally homogenized, not at all. And in fact, there were always regional tensions, difficulties, and so on and so forth. So at the end of the day, uh, it's, it, the, you've got to ask yourself, what are the critical variables that explain China's success in the world? And I can tell you, that the Chinese themselves were very frightened of globalization, very frightened. They did it very hesitantly, but once they plunged in and they succeeded, now the cultural confidence in China has exploded. Now in the same way, I believe that if India plunges into globalization and succeeds, the cultural confidence in India will also explode. 
And cultural confidence is such a key indicator of economic success that people haven't talked about. And this is where, frankly, let me come back to my very, very first point I started off with. Just look at the success of Indians in every other economy in the world. Use that as the benchmark. And if <laughs> Indians in India can be as successful as overseas Indians, India will have the largest economy in the world. Thank you, Professor Makhavani. Now I invite Dr. Joy Ilamin for a word of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Dimbi. Dimbi. Uh, respected dignitary, dignitaries and dear friends, uh, it has been a privilege as far as Kila is concerned to be part of this uh, five lecture series in memory of uh, Dr. K. Maran. And uh, at this moment, actually, I was, uh, for today's session, I was actually looking at the cover of the book, Has China Won? I, I can see, still see that behind you, sir. And uh, the Chinese challenge to the American primacy, which you have written. And then we have this uh, program, Can India Become Stronger Than China? Actually, are we ready for such a challenge this side? I mean, that's what I probably, both of you, Ram Kumar and uh, Professor uh, Ambassador had uh, just mentioned. So we had actually discussed about the potentials, the possibilities, and all. But as we all know, this entire governance and political models have to be analyzed and then see whether we can really realistically talk about raising this challenge. So let's uh, actually start thinking about that also. But uh, this opens. Uh, a lot of questions uh, for all of us, actually. So I don't want to get into all those discussions once again. Um, uh, basically, for today's session, definitely uh, on behalf of the Institute of Parliamentary Affairs and KILA, uh, we extend our sincere gratitude to Ambassador Kishore Mahbani for being with us and very patiently answering various questions. In fact, at the, even at the last moment, when Dr. Dibby has been again and again asking one more question, one more question kind of thing. And then finally, Dr. Ramakumar intervenes and says, why don't you answer the other question also? And then <laughs> and, and, and the, the way in which you reacted also was uh, very pleasing for all of us. Thank you very much, sir, for being with us and for this excellent lecture we had. And uh, Madam Amrita and Madam Chitra who are with us, and they were with us for many of the other lectures, lectures also. Uh, thanks to both of them. And uh, Professor Ram Kumar, he's part and parcel of all these things which we do here, whether it's at the Institute of Parliamentary Affairs or with Kila or with so many other things happening in Kerala and India, especially on this side. So, but again, uh, thank you for being with us and also for the right interventions and right responses at this point of time. Getting things into perspective, that is what we have done. So, thank you, Dr. Ram Kumar. And uh, Dr. Raju Narayana Swami, who's the principal secretary of, uh, and also the he heading this Institute of Parliamentary Affairs. Thank you, sir, for being with us, even though you have been, uh, you have been in Idiki uh, overseeing the code prevention activities. Thank you, sir, for being with us. And of course, uh, I mean, I don't have enough words to thank uh, Dr. Dimbi for getting us into this whole thing. Because it has been a really great thing for Killa to be part of all these intellectual and uh, political exercises which we do here. So thank you for. Uh, in fact, I have to tell all others that it's simply Dr. Dimbi, Dr. Dimbi's work, and uh, we are only with him. That is all. Nothing else. Everything has been planned and done. But all the networking, all the contacts, everything has been done by him. Thank you, Dr. Dimbi, for being with us, and the, all the earlier speakers, or the this is the last one, the fifth one of the, in the series, and all the earlier speakers, the great uh, lectures we had, thank you, thank all of them for being with us and for delivering the lectures. Of course, the participants. See, I, mean, I never thought that we would have such kind of people and all youngsters uh, being with us throughout and also asking I mean, questions, uh, the relevant questions at the right moment, and uh, that's again, I mean, that's actually gives us confidence to venture into such activities again and again. Thank you all, all the participants for being with us. 
And finally, the Institute of Parliamentary Affairs team, not a great big team, large team, but still, um, yeah, that small team which does all these things, thanks to all of them. And uh, finally, my colleagues in Krila, especially Mr. Matthew Andrews, Andrews, the assistant director, Mr. Nirash, who manages the technical aspects, and Anup, who have been with us for all these lecture series, lectures. Thank you all, and thank you once again. Thank you. Dr. Joy, thank uh, you, sir. let's all join thank hands you, sir, and uh, extend an invitation to Professor Kishore Mehbubani to visit Kerala so that he can see yeah, what we are doing in Kerala as well. I'm sure Kila can host it. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming. Once all this thank pandemic you, business is over, we As soon as COVID is over, sorry. I'm coming to Kerala. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you sir. Great pleasure and honor to be with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.